Hey, boaters, it's Jim from Raymarine. It's Thursday night, and this is Raymarine Live. Thank you for coming out and joining us this evening. I know it's been a little while since we've had an episode, so uh, very glad to get one out to you. We are on the eve of Labor Day weekend here in the United States, which is kind of the traditional end of the summer season for those areas of the country that transition into fall and then winter. I know you guys down, in, down there in Florida, it's summertime year round, but up in our neck of the woods anyway, this is kind of the end of the summer season, but this is obviously a huge boating weekend. So we know a lot of you are going to be out there hitting the water, fishing, cruising, sailing, all sorts of things like that. So definitely get out there, have a good time, boat safely, and uh, and just certainly enjoy the long weekend ahead. So tonight, um, we have a couple things we're going to be talking about. Um, the primary focus tonight is going to be uh, kind of what's new in Axiom. I realize it's also been a while since we've done an episode, so we are going to go very, very heavy on your questions tonight. So if you have questions or comments or anything you want to ask, certainly get those into the chat. Um, I will take as many of those as we can during the hour. And of course, uh, for anything we don't get to during the live show, I will follow, you up, follow up with you through the comments uh, or via email at the end. Um, Part of the agenda for tonight was to talk a little bit about Yachtsense Link and the new Raymarine app. And I must admit, we had a little uh, technical hiccup here. Um, the hardware I needed for tonight's show is uh, on a truck somewhere out for delivery. So, so um, I'm probably going to cover a lot of Raymarine app stuff in our next episode, assuming that that is going to arrive at some point. But uh, it has not come through the door here in our Nashua office uh, before we close from the end of the day. So. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the app, uh, but I won't be able to show you as much as I had hoped to tonight. Uh, but I think we can make up for that with uh, with your questions and comments. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is Lighthouse 4. So when we last had uh, an episode, uh, which was quite a while ago, we had uh, launched Lighthouse 4. Um, and we had actually done a couple of minor updates to that software as well since we have last spoken. Um, so if you um, are on Lighthouse 4 on your Axiom, if you regularly check for updates, you would have seen your Axiom offer you uh, version 4.0.70. Um, and then within the last week or two, um, it would have offered you version 4.0.85. Um, the, the 85 update, which is the latest version up there now, I will say um, don't rush to update. Um, that one is basically kind of a housekeeping update for us. Um, as you know, with the pandemic going on, there's all sorts of worldwide uh, chip shortages and electronics component shortages. So in order for us to keep building axioms, we had to change out a few little components inside our hardware so that that version 85 software is really just for compatibility for our purposes for manufacturing um, so unless you were to go out today and buy a brand new axiom uh, that had version 85 on it and introduce it into a system with some older axioms um, the older axioms would need the update but otherwise anybody else out there um, you can probably skip this one and the reason i advise you to skip it is because version 4.1 which is a much more meaningful up grade is actually right on the horizon. Um, so over the last several weeks, um, we have actually been doing a beta test um, of version 4.1. Um, I actually kind of recruited a lot of folks from the audience here uh, that seemed interested in our software development processes and people that were really power users and whatnot. Um, so I appreciate all of you that volunteered to be beta testers. And hopefully um, you saw some interesting things in the 4.1 software. And um, I know we got a tremendous amount of feedback from everyone that was testing for us. We really appreciate that. Um, and I think you're going to see um, some pretty cool things um, when that software comes out. And it's due, I would say, within the next week or two. Um, so it is on the horizon. So again, um, if you were planning on updating before you head out this weekend, uh, I would just wait. Uh, run whatever software you're running. Hold out till the 4.1 uh, releases in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, Another thing we have going on here at Raymarine, obviously we are coming into fall uh, boat show season. Uh, so if you want to come and see uh, products, see what's new, put your hands on some things, uh, or you got questions on products you already own, certainly come and visit us at any of the upcoming fall boat shows. 
Um, the big ones for us through the fall season, we will be at the Newport, Rhode Island uh, International Boat Show. Uh, we will be at the Annapolis Sail Show. Um, and then, of course, we will be at the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show. So uh, come and check out everything we've got there. So um, I have my Axiom here tonight. It is upgraded to 4.00.85. And I thought the first thing I would show you, just as a reminder for anybody that is interested in how to check for updates on your system, um, is how we go about doing that. So Mr. Producer Man, if you want to bring the Axiom up full screen for me. And I just want to kind of review with the audience where you can check your software level and where you can get updates. Um, so right from your Axiom home screen, um, you can touch settings. And right here on this uh, first tab that appears, the tab um, uh, reports the software version. Uh, so this one has 4.00.85. Uh, it also tells me what I have in here for charts. I've got an Avionics Platinum Plus plugged in, and it tells me the last time I updated my chart uh, as well. Looks like it's time to update again. I did it back in March. It's been a while. Um, if we want to update software in Axiom, we just touch this button right here, Update Software. <clears throat> and I can either pre-download from raymarine.com onto an SD card, plug it in, and tell it to look at the SD card reader. Or I can do an online software update. So this uses the Wi-Fi connection in your Axiom. Uh, down here, you would uh, tell it what Wi-Fi network to connect to. So if you're at your marina and they have uh, public Wi-Fi on the docks, or if you have mobile hotspot on your smartphone, uh, choose your uh, network. In this case, I'm already connected to the office guest network, so I am ready to go. Otherwise, you would choose your network or your hotspot, type your password in, and then when Axiom connects to it, you can just close that Wi-Fi display and hit the start button. And then when you hit start, what happens is Axiom communicates with Raymarine's servers. It will actually look not only for itself, but for all the other devices on your network. So you can see I have this Axiom hooked up to a bunch of i70 instruments. I have a CTOC NG converter, um, some other, other doohickeys on the network. Um, and anything that needs an update would have um, this box already pre-checked. So that tells me things that are out of date that it'll, it'll download software for. Um, I updated this display right before our broadcast tonight, so it is technically already up to date, and that's why none of these boxes are checked. Uh, but if you have old software in any of your devices, the boxes will be checked. And then over here, you would just hit the button that says Update Selected. And any, anything that has a checkbox will get updated automatically. Um, the files that Axiom is pulling down, just so you know, in case you're doing this on a metered mobile hotspot, uh, you're looking at just under a gigabyte of data, probably anywhere from 800 megs to a gig, depending on how many uh, peripherals it is updating. So it is uh, a pretty big file. Um, at today's data speeds, it only takes a few minutes for it to pull that down if you have a good connection. Uh, but just be advised, it is going to use some of your mobile data. Um, if you're doing it on Wi-Fi to a shoreside connection, you don't have to worry too much about that. The whole process to update uh, an Axiom display on its own takes about four minutes. If you have multiple displays networked together, uh, what will happen is the display that you started the update on will push the updates to all the other equipment first, and then it does itself last. Um, and figure about four minutes per item that it's updating. Um, and when it's done, it'll be ready for use. Um, so that's how you actually go through the update process. And again, um, I wouldn't be in a rush to put this 4.00.85 in there unless you are adding a brand new Axiom fresh from our factory to your boat this weekend. Um, then your older equipment or your older Axioms of your network to it might need it for compatibility. But otherwise, um, there's no really benefit to anybody out there on the water uh, to that version 85 uh, software. Wait for version 4.1 that's coming up pretty soon. So I see we have a ton of questions in here already. So um, let's uh, let's just go right to some questions. Uh, what do you got for me, Mr. Producer Man from Todd Johnson? Thanks for the question, Todd. With Axiom AR using two Cam 210 cameras facing forward, will it be possible to stitch the two video feeds together into one view in the future? Is this being considered for development? Uh, this is a really great question. And let me show you on Axiom kind of what uh, Todd is referring referring to. Um, let's bring the Axiom back up full screen if we can. Um, so to answer your question directly, um, right now, um, it is not possible to stitch those two cameras together. 
Um, you can build a view and put two cameras side by side. And if you actually get up there on your mast uh, or wherever your cameras are mounted, get your little wrench out to adjust them, you can almost stitch them together on, you know, just by moving the cameras and kind of setting them. Um, but officially, we don't have that stitching capability in there. Um, it is something that we have suggested to our software developers, and I know our team has taken a look at it. Um, certainly, there are some really awesome things they can do with uh, stitched together video. I mean, in a lot of cars today, you get that bird's eye view for maneuvering your car. I know there's some marine systems for that as well. So it's certainly something that we uh, can take a look at. Um, if you wanted to try to mimic that capability, let me just kind of show you how you would do it on the display. Um, I'm going to take this radar tile. I'm going to long press on it and go to customize. Um, and then I'm going to split it up into two windows, either side by side, and it could be uh, just two, or um, I could do four apps side by side. But however I do it, I want to get two video windows adjacent to each other. So I'm going to put a video window here and a video window here. And in my other two tiles, I'm just going to fill those with kind of whatever. I'm going to put chart or fish finder. If you had four cameras, you could put four cameras in there too. I'm going to say next. I'm going to save this tile. Um, and just to show what this layout would look like, and keep in mind that this uh, actually doesn't have any camera connected to it at the moment. But what you would get here is camera number one on the left, camera number two on the right. Um, so what you could do here is from your cameras on the boat, Todd, you could pick your port facing camera and your starboard facing camera. Um, bring them side by side in this interface. Um, you'd be able to pick them right out of the menu. Um, then if you want to do any kind of manual adjustments to the actual camera mounts, you could get something pretty close to a stitched image. Um, but I certainly understand what you want to do. And with augmented reality in particular, that would be really cool because with AR, we can add uh, those flags and things like that uh, to it as well. Um, and having that over stitch image would be really, really cool. Um, so know that that suggestion actually has been made. We're taking a look at it. We'll see what we can do there. Uh, what else have we got, Mr. Producer Man from Allen? Hoping the SmartCraft Connect updates are coming soon. Looking forward to a full Mercury control on the Axiom screen. Uh, yes, we actually have some really good news on that topic uh, as well. So SmartCraft Connect, for anybody that doesn't know, is uh, Mercury's um, engine display system. SmartCraft Connect is actually their networking uh, protocol. And SmartCraft Connect allows um, vessel view data from Mercury to be displayed on third-party displays like Raymarine um, and other brands of electronics. Um, we have been adding a lot of SmartCraft features um, with every one of our uh, releases. Um, when we get to version 4.1, uh, which is coming out very shortly, um, there is going to be several new things in that release. Um, it will support Skyhook. Uh, it is going to support uh, the uh, engine uh, fluid level checks. There's like, like for your oil and your gear oil and that sort of stuff, uh, plus a bunch of other uh, SmartCraft uh, features. Um, one of the things that's very exciting for us is that's going to um, enable us to you know, basically fully displace uh, a vessel view instrument uh, from the helm of any boat. So if you wanted to go with Mercury engines and have all the Mercury data fully on Raymarine displays and not worry about having a little gauge anywhere else, that will be totally legal, uh, totally blessed by Raymarine and Mercury, covered by your engine warranty and all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's pretty cool. So with 4.1, you will see some more uh, SmartCraft uh, features uh, in there. Um, so we'll have some more information on that coming very soon. From John, when will we get a stable version of Lighthouse 4? Um, it's a great question, John. And to be honest with you, yeah, we definitely had uh, a couple of speed bumps when Lighthouse 4 released the first time. It was, um, it was a rather interesting launch because there were, honestly, there were some people that had no issues whatsoever. They updated from three to four and went boating and we never heard from them. Um, but there were certainly a, a large number of you out there, too, that did have uh, some issues. And um, it took us a little while to figure out what was going on with them. Um, so for you, John, if you're still on the original Lighthouse 4 build, definitely make sure you get your system up to version 70. It's 4.00.70 or the 4.00.85 um, that's out there. Um, uh, you, you would probably benefit from an update uh, to that. 
Um, if you're having a lot of trouble still with crashes or slowdowns or just any kind of weirdness on the system, definitely um, reach out to our support team. Um, one of the things uh, we will have you do um, if you are still getting kind of weirdness or instability on the system, uh, we may have you do a factory reset um, or we may have you do something called a cache wipe on your display. And it's kind of a back end uh, secret key press, if you will, um, they get you into a part of, of an axiom that you normally would never see in normal operation, but it allows you to go a little bit deeper into the operating system and flush some backend data out of it. Um, so if you are seeing some weird things, John, definitely um, leave another comment in there or even shoot me an email, james.mcgowan at raymarine.com. Um, and I can get those directions out to you because we definitely want to get your system uh, running nice and stable. Um, most of them out there are running great now. Um, so if there's something going on with yours, we definitely want to have a look. Mr. Terry P, is the Raymarine RNS5 replacement for the HS5? And are there any differences? Ah, yes. I actually didn't have that on my what's new list, but I should have. So, um, HS5 and RNS5 are network switches. And I used to have one here on the table behind me, but I think I had to give it up to, to uh, get used uh, elsewhere, probably on a boat. Um, but the RNS5 and HS5 uh, network switches, those enable you to connect uh, Raynet high speed devices together. So when you're putting together a system with Axiom and radar and sonars and FLIR cameras and all that sort of stuff, a lot of the high bandwidth information travels over Ethernet cable um, on our Raynet connector system. So it's basically waterproof, marinized Ethernet. Um, every Axiom display has at least one Raynet port on it. And if you have a very small system, you might be able to just connect your radar directly to an Axiom or connect a couple of Axiom displays together to network them. Um, but once you start getting into you know, more than two screens and a radar, maybe a camera or two, you're definitely gonna have a network switch uh, somewhere on board your boat under your helm uh, to host all of these ethernet devices. So the, the uh, HS5 was the ethernet switch that we have had on the market for many, many years. And uh, as we got into the height of the worldwide global chip shortage, suddenly HS5s became very hard to manufacture. Um, so we, kind of had a uh, dual strategy to get them back as quickly as we could, because obviously it's a very critical piece of infrastructure on a Raymarine system. Um, so HS5s, um, uh, we, we, we both reworked those and uh, we have HS5s on the way, but we also have an RNS5, which um, is a new five port network switch um, available. Uh, and that was launched just a couple of weeks ago. So um, are there differences between them? Uh, yes, there is. So on an HS5, which is the original five port network switch, um, four of its five ports are uh, 100 megabit uh, ports. And then its fifth port is a gigabit, gigabit speed port. And you would use the gigabit port um, either for a fifth high bandwidth device or to connect to another switch. And that's to keep the network throughput up very high. The new HS5 switch is gigabit speed on all five of its ports. So it is a faster switch overall. Um, we decided to make the jump um, as we were designing this new switch to get faster throughput because we know uh, so many boaters today are putting lots of ethernet devices on their network. So they might have cam multiple cameras, be running augmented reality and a FLIR and a radar, maybe two radars and a sonar and multiple MFDs, uh, plus maybe a Yachtsense link uh, mobile router, so you're going to have internet traffic uh, running over those wires as well. Um, so the H, uh, so the RNS fives are gigabit speed uh, on all five of their ports, so they are they are faster. Um, but we do have uh, both of those switches uh, available. Um, RNS fives are in stock, and HS fives I think are also in stock, or they will be imminently. I know we have some on the way. So if you are waiting on a network switch, you should be receiving it very soon. Robert would like to know, can Axiom show color shading just like the Navionics app on a cell phone? Um, so by color shading, I think what you might be referring to is what they call shaded relief. And that is something um, that we support on our system. Uh, Mr. Producer Man, if you want to bring the Axiom up full screen for me, 
Uh, I am going to bring up first um, our simulator. Uh, so I'm going to move the boat somewhere else to where I have Navionics coverage. Here, we'll pick the fishing profile for this. Here in the studio, I have a couple of different sources of data feeding into my Axiom. So depending on what I need to show you, I can uh, make it do different things. So here I am in the chart mode. And this is all the simulated data that's built in. We do this kind of for boat shows primarily. Um, so we got some simulated data feeding into it. I'm going to move the boat a little bit more up here towards the northeast, just because I know that's where my Navionics chart is that I have uh, plugged in. So I'm going to do a long press on my chart, more options, and move the boat here. This is just purely a simulation thing. All right, so I need to bring up my Navionics data. Um, our chart plotter can run multiple types of charts at the same time. I have a Lighthouse chart in here, and I have a Navionics in here. So let me bring up the Navionics data, and we're going to zoom in a little bit. And this chart has uh, shaded relief uh, data turned on. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. Um, and then I'm going to um, bring that uh, layer on. So I'm going to go to Menu. Um, it is technically a fishing layer. Um, so I'm going to bring my fishing layer up. And then I'm going to go down here to my gears and layers. And if we come down a little bit, uh, Navionics overlays. Uh, I am going to turn relief shading on. And I'm going to turn it on for land and sea. And this is what they call relief shading. So what they have done is they have colorized their bathymetric uh, chart information. Um, so it does give you quite a lot of detail uh, what is there in the offshore areas. We can like zoom in on this reef area, for example, and you can see all the dimples and pock marks. Um, so the colorization helps to bring out the detail of what is there uh, on the bottom. Um, this particular chart I have is the U.S. Uh, Northeast and Canyon. So I think it's called a, it's the Navionics 904 uh, Platinum Plus. And then I added the relief shading layer to it uh, by actually activating my card on the Navionics um, app uh, and downloading this extra layer uh, into my system. Um, so that is how you turn relief shading on. Um, it is just a, basically a layer. So you would go into the fishing mode on your chart plotter. So go to mode fishing chart, come down here to your settings. Uh, your layers control kind of controls all the things that can be turned on or off on your chart. And there's actually a section down here. This was a Lighthouse 4 edition, um, this new menu called Navionics Overlays. And because this chart has relief shading programmed on it, that's the only overlay it, um, it offers me. Um, and then I can adjust the transparency of it here. So if I want to be able to see um, data through um, the shading, I can actually turn the transparency down and you can see the other bathymetric lines starting to bleed through. Um, or if you just want to see entirely the colorization, you can go all the way back up to 100% or anywhere in between. Um, and then you can put the relief shading um, just over land. If you do it just over the land, you're basically getting satellite photos on the land. Uh, but if you go land and sea, then it adds the colorization on the uh, sea areas. You can also do land in shallow. So if you only want to see it in shallow water areas, uh, it'll add overlay there, but then it'll cut it out in the deeper water. But with this relief shading uh, tool, uh, people generally want to see this in the deep water. So go land and sea, um, and that will uh, will bring it up. And then anywhere you scroll around on your Navionics chart, assuming you have that data set added to it, uh, you'll get this relief shading um, in all the water areas. And it has some really cool uh, information in it. Um, so there's good example of what it looks like on the land uh, and what it looks like on the water right next to it. So this type of information, this relief shading, this is actually something over the last few years that's become uh, tremendously uh, popular. So um, Navionics has it in their Platinum Plus charts. Um, depending on where you go uh, fishing, um, there are a couple of other chart makers that we work with as well that offer uh, similar uh, um, relief uh, colored relief shading. Uh, Seymour mapping uh, is very, very popular, particularly down in the southeast and around Florida and into the Gulf. Uh, Strike Lines is another chart vendor that uh, works on Axiom. Strike Lines also has uh, colorized relief shading, high definition, uh, bathymetric. So um, if you're doing diving, uh, fishing, reef fishing, um, 
just out there looking for, you know, whatever's on the bottom. Um, they, there are some pretty good charts from all of those vendors. So definitely check them out. All right. What else we got for questions in here tonight? From Larry. I installed a YachtSense link on my sailboat. Where can I get help trying to get the most out of it? All right. Great question, Larry. Thank you for getting a YachtSense link for your boat. I'm glad yours arrived and you got it installed. So we recently did post a series of nine YachtSense link kind of getting started videos. They are more focused around the setup of the device. It sounds like yours is up and running. So those may or may not be helpful to you, but you'll find them uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, or if you go to the YachtSense link page on remarine.com, we have a link to them from there. Um, if you have particular questions about it too, certainly feel free to drop those in here. I can try to tackle them either live on the show tonight uh, or I, I can get back to you um, offline um, and answer your questions about it. And certainly at any time too, feel free to uh, reach out to our um, technical support team. Uh, either give us a call or you can uh, create a ticket over on uh, raymarine.com through the support area um, and they can respond to tickets there uh, as well. We will also have a um, an all... Yacht Sense link episode of Raymarine Live coming up uh, probably two weeks my, is my guess. Uh, where we will kind of do a deep dive into the whole system, uh, how to set it up, uh, what you can do with it, some of the cool things uh, that it can control. I'm going to try to get a, a special guest in for this. Um, you probably saw if anybody watched any of those Yacht Sense link videos that we posted. Uh, Matt um, is our in-house uh, expert on all things Yacht Sense link, um, so let me see if I can. Uh, suck him in here for a Raymarine Live and you can uh, meet him in person uh, or maybe Brian, who's our product manager for that. Uh, but they're both great resources on that product uh, as well. Um, but if you've got questions, certainly drop them in the comments or shoot me an email, james.mcgowan at raymarine.com uh, or open a ticket with our support team and uh, we'll get you answers. Tom and Laurel. That's a great photo. What are the subscriptions for YachtSense and why do you need them? So with uh, YachtSense Link, um, the uh, Raymarine app, which I had hoped to show you in detail tonight, um, is kind of a companion product that works with the YachtSense Link router. Um, so through the Raymarine app, uh, you can do some basic things in terms of um, you can mirror the screen from your MFD and control it uh, remotely on board your boat. Um, you can also view data from your network. Um, so if you have NEMA 2000 or CTOC NG information and you want to have a little display of data cards on your phone as you're walking around the boat and see depth and speed and distance to waypoint and all that sort of stuff, um, there's a display you can customize. So that's, that's a free part of the app. Um, you can do some data transfer back and forth um, with the app. Um, but the subscriptions add some premium features to YachtSense. Um, so if you subscribe for YachtSense Premium, um, the number one feature it gives you is something called GeoFence. Um, so with GeoFence, what you can actually do is you can define a zone or multiple zones um, through, the, uh, through the Raymarine app um, that are basically tracking zones uh, for your boat. And if your boat uh, enters, or departs one of those zones that you have set up on the map, um, it can automatically send you a text message to let you know that your boat has uh, moved uh, in or out uh, of one of these zones. So it's a good way to keep an eye on your boat. Um, if you loaned it out to the kids or something and you wanna make sure that they stay within a certain distance of wherever you want them to be, uh, you could set up a geofence for that. Um, if someone was moving your boat for you and you wanted to know when they got to Fort Lauderdale, you could put a geofence around the entrance to Fort Lauderdale Inlet. And when the boat comes through that geofence zone, it will text you and say, the boat is here. Um, so that's one thing that you can do with it. Um, another thing that YachtSense can do on the premium subscription, uh, you can see data from the boat when you're not on board. So if someone is, again, maybe using your boat or running your boat and you want to log in remotely, and just kind of see um, where they are, uh, see data from your network. Maybe you want to see, you know, how far they are from a waypoint, or um, see how fast they're going, or how much fuel they're burning, or that sort of thing. You can actually see the data um, uh, from the system uh, from off the boat. YachtSense also has four digital input/output channels, and those can be used to monitor sensors on board the boat. Um, you can do some light digital switching functions with them. So if you wanted to 
uh, maybe have it hooked up to turn your bilge pump on or off or turn lighting on or off or um, you control uh, lights or other electrical devices. Um, being able to remote control those from off the boat is part of the premium subscription as well. Um, so you get some, some extra bonus features, some pretty nice stuff uh, with the subscription. Um, uh, so if that is something you're interested in, you can add that to it. Um, but the subscription is not required to use the basic uh, YachtSense product. Um, YachtSense right out of the box is a uh, 4G marine router. You set it up with up to two uh, mobile carriers of your choice. Um, it is what they call a unified networking product. So um, it creates a network on board your boat, both wired and wireless, that all of your internet uh, capable devices can connect to. Um, so you set up your smartphones, your smart TVs, the kids' gaming systems, security cameras, ring doorbells, whatever other internet devices you have on board your boat. Uh, they all connect to the boat's network generated by YachtSense Link. When you are within range of a shoreside Wi-Fi hotspot, YachtSense Link will send the traffic through that route. Uh, but if you pull away from the dock and you are out of range of Wi-Fi, it automatically switches all the network traffic to your 4G mobile uh, um, uh, SIM cards uh, out to the mobile network. Um, and it's a seamless transition. That's what makes it so cool. So all those devices on board the boat, you never have to change their network settings. They, they stay connected to the boat. They stay connected to the YachtSense Link network. And YachtSense Link figures out where to send the network traffic, whether it's through Wi-Fi, or through 4G mobile uh, through either of your carriers. And the reason we have two SIM cards in there, um, it, it allows you to either set it up with two you know, domestic carriers. So maybe you want to have an AT&T and a Verizon SIM card because the area you cruise, cruise over, uh, you get better coverage with one network here and another network there. So that's one way you could use it. Uh, for boats that go between uh, international destinations, maybe you go from uh, from the U.S. side of the Great Lakes over to the Canadian side of the Great Lakes, or you go from Florida to the Bahamas, um, you could have a U.S. carrier in one of your SIM card slots and then an international SIM card carrier in the other slot. Uh, so that way you can avoid international data roaming charges. So when you're in the Bahamas, you use the Bahamas Telecom SIM card uh, through YachtSense Link. When you get back to Florida, you're on T-Mobile or Verizon or whatever you like. Um, so some pretty cool things you can do with that product. What else we got in here, Mr. Producer Man? Sailor Fred, I have anchorages on my iPad with Navionics, but don't have it on my chart plotter at the helm. Is there a way to get that? Um, so that's a great question. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking about um, in that. So in the Navionics iPad app, you have all of their chart information. So if it is actually something that is part of the Navionics navigation chart, you should be able to see that on your chart plotter at the helm with Navionics charts plugged in. And if you're not seeing it, it could just be that you don't have um, a layer turned on that needs to be turned on. And I will show you how to do that. Um, the other thing I will say though, is that the Navionics app also um, can access um, Navionics user generated content and things that are contributed by boaters. And so there's some layers of details that are exclusive to their app. So I'm not sure if the data you're seeing could be one of those. Uh, but let me show you where in your Axiom display you can control um, what level of detail you see on your charts. Um, so what I'm going to do here, if you can maybe turn off his question for a second. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I am going to go up here to my menu. Uh, in the chart. Oops, when I get the right mouse, that was the wrong mouse. All right, I'm going to open my menu. I am going to come down here to, um, actually, I'm going to back up one second. Uh, I am going to go out of the fishing chart just for this. I'm going to go back to what we call a detailed view. Um, so I'm going to get rid of the shaded relief um, just so we're looking more at uh, just regular old chart information here. Um, and just for fun, let's zoom in a little bit so that as I'm changing some of these settings, um, you can see things happen uh, on the chart. All right. So I'm going to go up in here to the menu. And the first thing I'll point out is these chart modes. So we had been in fishing mode and I switched to a detailed uh, navigation chart. We also have a simple detailed chart. And one of the things you'll notice is when I go to simplified mode, uh, and let me zoom back out just a little bit. 
um, it strips away some of the information from the chart. So there is there are so many layers of information on an avionics chart that if you turn everything on, um, the chart can get pretty thick with information. And sometimes you'll end up with stuff piled uh, on top of one another. And they can honestly be a little bit hard to read with everything turned on. Um, so this is just a quick way to go from a simplified view uh, to a more detailed view of the chart. And you can see we've added uh, some 3D terrain. We've added contour lines, uh, spot soundings, that sort of thing. Um, but we can even adjust it a bit further. So if I come down here to the bottom to where my gears are, this goes into my settings tabs. And I'm going to start over on this one here called layers. <clears throat> so even within the detailed chart, I can have different uh, levels of detail. Um, so I can go low and you can see over there in my window, it'll, it'll update automatically. So there's low detail, medium detail, and high detail. So you can see every time I, I click up, it starts adding more uh, layers to the mix. And I'm going to zoom it in just a little bit again. So you can really see kind of what's being added, what's being taken away. So again, just to kind of review, there's low, there's medium, uh, and there's high. And then as you come down through this tab, um, some of these layers are Navionics things, some of them are not. So for example, AIS, if you have an AIS receiver, this will add the contacts. This would be your radar overlay, so that's not really Navionics. Um, if you wanted to see tide stations, tide stations, uh, there's one over here to the right that popped up. Um, so it's actually showing me the tidal flow um, uh, there, uh, or I can turn that off. So that is uh, part of the Navionics uh, uh, information right there. Tides and currents both turn on or off uh, with that. Uh, this is drone. This is uh, camera field of view. So those aren't Navionics related. Uh, in fact, we're going to scroll down a little bit more here. So in Navionics, we had our overlays that we looked at before. So this turned on that satellite overlay with a shaded relief. Um, community edits. So if you update your charts through the Navionics app or online, you can actually add some of that user-generated content in. So the anchorage that you are looking for could be community added data. So make sure you update your chart and turn this toggle on. And you can see uh, a couple of red icons. These are community uh, uh, generated uh, items um, that someone has contributed to Navionics. And if you long press on those in the normal chart, it'll give you all the detail about it. Um, another Navionics feature here is this one called Easy View. Uh, and for people like me who are getting a little bit older and our eyesight is starting to go, um, easy view bumps the font size up on everything, which is kind of nice. Um, not only does it increase the fonts, but it magnifies the chart too. Um, and even people with better eyesight than me sometimes like the easy view just because it allows you to stand further back from the helm and still see things at a glance. Now, there's actually another tab where we can go even deeper into um, the detailed levels of things. Um, so I'm going to start here with the depths tab. So you can see I have all of my spot soundings turned on, but um, currently I'm only showing spot soundings as deep as 33 feet. So if I wanna see spot soundings out to deeper depths, I can either select what depth I want to add them out to, and you can see them populating there out at the edges of the chart, or I can just come up here and I can say, uh, turn them all on, or I can turn them all off. So again, this is ways that you can kind of customize just how much information you are seeing. You know, maybe you're not fishing, so you're not too concerned about the depth. As long as the depth is deep enough that you're not going to run aground, all right, anything over 20 feet deep, don't worry about it. Don't turn it on. So this allows you to kind of constrain it or put it wherever you want. Um, personally, I run around with everything turned on. I like all, um, but you can set it up however you like. You can also do the same thing for your contour lines. So you can see the contour lines kind of connect together some of the depths to kind of show you the terrain on the bottom. Right now I'm only showing contour lines out to 66 feet deep. Um, but if I wanted to see them in, uh, in deeper areas, um, I can either turn all of them on um, or I can specify. Let me just zoom out a little bit, maybe so we can see that happen. I need to get some deeper water in the map. So out here where it's like 80, 90, 100 feet. So right now there's no contour lines beyond 66. Uh, but let's say I wanna go, oops, go the other way. All right, we'll go this way. Let's say all, there we go. <clears throat> so when I turn on all contour lines, you can see it's added more out here uh, in the deeper water. 
Um, this is uh, shallow area shading. Um, so if I want to be warned where shallow areas are to stay out of, um, I set my safety depth to whatever value I want. So if I want to see areas that are 15 feet or less, um, anywhere that has this red speckle on it is areas 15 feet or less. So that's called shallow water shading. Um, you can also adjust the colorization of where the white versus blue versus darker blue is. That's what these contour lines. So you have deep contour and you can make the deepest water on the map can be either white or blue. Uh, so if you want to change it, you can do that here uh, as well. Um, the last place you can adjust Navionic settings is on this advanced tab. Um, so down here, you've got even more layers or categories of things that can be turned on or turned off. So for example, if you didn't want to see navigation aids, you can turn them off or turn them on. And if you look closely at the chart, you'll see the buoys disappear and reappear when I click them on and off. You can change the, um, the icon, icons that it uses, whether you want international or US uh, standard uh, icons. Uh, most people usually run international icons on Navionics because they're slightly larger. Uh, same thing like we were doing with contour lines and spot soundings, we can do the same for rocks. So uh, rocks are usually uh, a symbol that looks similar to an asterisk on the chart. And if you boat in places like Maine, there's a lot of rocks and a lot of these asterisks on the chart. And if you're not interested in rocks uh, deeper than a certain depth, you can turn them off. So right now I'm only showing rocks as deep as 10 feet. Uh, anything uh, 11 feet or greater uh, just won't show on the map. I'm not interested in seeing them. Uh, we can turn off the sectors associated with lighthouses. Routing systems is usually traffic lanes, uh, caution areas. Um, uh, if there's like a marine sanctuary or a boundary or some other area, you can see the, um, the red boundary line over here turns on or off as I flip that. Uh, marine features uh, often is um, additional detail about those boundary lines or special markers. Um, you can turn on or off land features. So you can see some things over there on that island get turned on or off with that category um, and so on and so forth. The categories kind of explain themselves, but I think you get the picture that um, you can go layer by layer through a Navionics chart and turn all sorts of things on or off. Um, so if you're not seeing your anchorages, I would check, maybe just bump it up to high detail level to start and see if you get what you want uh, or take a look at those community edits and see if that's a community uh, added feature. And if you're really not sure what it is, um, snap me a screenshot on your iPad and email it to me, james.mcgowan at raymarine.com. I'll take a look, see if I can figure out what it is and uh, tell you how to get it on your Axiom display. Ryan has three axioms. One is at the back for fishing. Sometimes somebody will accidentally brush against this axiom, changing the settings. Is there a way to deactivate the touch screen on this axiom? Uh, there is, Ryan. So um, on axiom displays, there is something called uh, touch lock on them. Um, and I believe I can activate it on this display as well. Uh, so let's bring this one back up full screen, if you could. Um, so this is an Axiom XL uh, display. Um, and similar to the Axiom 7, 9, and 12, this is a touch-only product. There is no uh, keyboard uh, on it. Um, the only touchable uh, interface on this is the power key. Um, so if I want to activate touch lock on a touch-only product, what I do is I swipe the power key with my finger um, and this um, uh, menu will come up. Oops, this quick action menu. And you can see here I have a button that says activate uh, touch lock. And now that I have it in touch lock mode, I can touch it. I can smear my hand all over it. And obviously you see nothing uh, happens. Um, now, if I want to get this out of touch lock mode, what I do is I swipe uh, the power key again. Come on back. Oops. And there we go. It says touchscreen reactivated. I was swiping it the wrong way. Uh, so let me demonstrate that one more time. And just to show you, now touch touch is reactivated, right? I touch the fish finder. Um, you know, I can move the screen around. I can do all sorts of things here, right? So touch touch is active. Here we'll put the 3D fish finder on. Uh, if I want to lock it, I just swipe the power key. Uh, I say activate touch lock. I get a little uh, message on the screen, a confirmation. It says that the touch lock is activated. So now when I touch it, mm -hmm. It completely ignores my touches. It doesn't do anything at all. 
And then if I want to unlock it, I just swipe the power key again and it says touch screen reactivated. And now I am back in control of the system. Um, so you will find that on every Axiom product um, from the seven inch all the way through the 24 inch, even the Axiom Pros uh, have that as well. So if you turn touch lock on on an Axiom Pro, that's the model that has the built in uh, keypad down the right hand side. Um, it'll lock out the touch screen, but all the buttons uh, will still function. Um, so that's that's the best way to keep uh, people from accidentally uh, changing your settings or you know bumping against it, and uh, um, that should uh, should help with that problem. Christian installed a Lawrence fuel flow sender to my Axiom and no longer getting uh, and no longer getting a reading on the fuel flow. What setting do I choose from the list to see it on my screen? All right. Um, so that Lawrence fuel flow sender is a NEMA 2000 uh, sensor. Um, it's actually a pretty cool little kit um, that can be plumbed in basically to the fuel lines on any boat. And it will give you your um, like fuel uh, economy uh, data. Uh, so fuel flow um, is something that would get picked up or displayed either in Axiom's uh, dashboard app or you could bring it up as a data item. So for example, um, this is the dashboard app. Um, and this is gonna show a bunch of kind of pre-populated screens that are in the simulation. Um, so right now I've got battery voltage, I've got speed, I've got some engine data in here. Um, and there's various uh, layouts for this data. Um, so some of it is graphical, some of it is just numbers, um, and you can customize all of these. Um, but let's say, for example, um, I want to change out this display here and get some fuel flow information. Um, I long press on any of these cells in the dashboard app. I go to edit. And then I think here what you are going to be looking for is probably, let's see, not in the fuel category. Let me think here for a second. This is what we call the data manager. The data manager uh, kind of catalogs all of the NEMA 2000 data by uh, category. And um, I would have thought it would be fuel. Let me, let's dig in here a little bit. So we have fuel, fuel one and fuel two, fuel volume and fuel percentage. So this is actually showing me fuel tank levels here, I think is what that is doing. So let's look in engine. And with engine, There we go, fuel flow uh, instantaneous. So this would give you fuel flow data. And I don't have one of those sensors on my network. So right now it's just showing nothing. Um, but I think that is what you will be looking for. So take a look in that engine category um, and fuel flow should be in there. Um, and if uh, for some reason that does not bring it up on your system, um, give me a shout and I can certainly help you track it down. Um, but I think that's the one that you want. I believe it's fuel flow. Um, just to show you some of the other ways that you can display data on your system, because there's a bunch of different ways to do it. That was the dashboard app. But let's say you want to have fuel flow just, you know, out on the corner of your screen. So that as you're running along, you can see, you know, what's my fuel economy right now. Um, over here, you can see I've got depth kind of floating out here on top of my navigation chart. Um, if I wanted to add another one of these floating data items, I come up here to the menu. I go down here to settings and page settings. So this page that right now is set up for all chart is unique to um, uh, or, or is its own entity on our system. So this page always has depth on it. And I'm going to add something else. So I'm going to say add and uh, let's go down here to fuel again. Uh, oh, sorry, it wasn't fuel, it was engine, wasn't it? Engine, and down here somewhere, fuel flow. And you can see it added it over here. Um, and then I can actually, with my finger, I can just drag it and I can put it wherever I want. Maybe I wanna put it down in the corner. Um, and if you touch on any of these data boxes, um, you can make them larger or smaller. So maybe you want it really big or really small. And you can also move the ones around that are already here. So maybe I want this one to also be really big. So all this data is highly customizable. You can put it wherever you want. And when you're happy with it, you can say done. Um, and just to show you, so we can float data like this on top of any window on the system. So this could be chart, radar, fish finder, you name it. You can float, uh, I think it's up to four of these items um, on your display. Um, Axiom also has a sidebar. And if you pull from the left edge of your screen, 
um, you can actually pull out this data bar. And this data bar is universal. So this can be pulled out on, on top of anything. Um, so the items you program in here, uh, the same way. So let's say I want to change out this one. Uh, I just long press on it. I say edit. Again, back here to my data manager. Uh, I'm going to go to engine. And I'm going to come down to that uh, fuel flow. And now I have uh, fuel flow in here. And of course, if I had the device, it would populate a number in there. So lots of different ways that you can show that information, lots of places you can put it. Um, and again, if you have any trouble getting it to display, um, snap me a couple of pictures of how you're set up now and, uh, and shoot me an email and I can uh, help you get that squared away too. Let's see, it looks like it's about 10 to the hour, but we got a lot of questions in here still tonight. This is great, actually. So we'll just keep going with questions. From Richard, what does it take to get Android-based navigation apps that are not on Raymarine's list uploaded into Axiom Plus? Um, so um, our Axiom system has a little um, uh, ecosystem, if you will, called Raymarine Apps. And on an Axiom display, let's bring that back up full screen so I can show Richard where these are. Um, on an Axiom display, if you go to your home screen, there is a category down here called apps. And there's a certain number of apps that are built in um, with the operating system. There are additional apps that can be downloaded from raymarine.com. Um, and many of them are almost all of them are voting related with the exception of a couple of entertainment apps. Um, but I will say one of the things that we do is we curate the apps that will run on an Axiom. Um, we actually require anybody that builds an app for Axiom uh, to, to uh, kind of test it and build it to some standards so that we can be certain that it's not going to crash the network. Uh, we want to make sure that it doesn't undermine the core navigational functions of Axiom. Um, so you unfortunately can't take just any old Android app and load it on here. Uh, it is only apps that we have approved. Um, if there's an app you would really like to see on Axiom that we don't have, um, definitely uh, shoot me an email with a suggestion. Let us know what it is. Um, because many app developers um, are actually very keen to work with us. And um, it's not extremely difficult for them to port a version of their app uh, to run on Axiom. Um, for those that don't know, Axiom is actually Android based. Um, so in the background, it is running Android underneath, um, which is what enables us to develop so many of these apps so rapidly. Um, but we do have a curation process. We want to make sure that it's not going to uh, corrupt the navigational um, uh, capabilities of the system. So you know, Angry Birds or uh, Fortnite or I don't know, whatever other crazy apps out there. Tinder, uh, not yet on Axiom anyway. But if you want those, let us know. It's, anything's possible. And we got time for a few more questions. Bill, issues with an RVX 1000 losing bottom when over a school of large bait connected to a new Axiom 9. Any suggestions besides doing a hard reset? Um, so, uh, one thing I will advise, Bill, definitely check for me what the software level is uh, on your Axiom and your RVX 1000. Um, over the last six to 10 months, in several of our uh, software releases, our Sonar guys had done a lot of work on bottom tracking. Um, and I know that this was an issue that they were working on in particular, was um, uh, getting over a big bait school. Uh, the bait school, sometimes the bait would be packed so dense it would fool the sounder into thinking that the bait was the bottom. Um, and the echoes would be bouncing off the top of the school of bait and then and it would uh, lose track of the bottom. Um, so they did change the tracking algorithms. Um, they made several improvements that are kind of incremental. Um, if you pull down the latest update for your system, um, it'll have all of those uh, changes in there. Um, the RVX 1000 module. Um, is our Real Vision 3D sonar module. It's very similar to the sonar that's in an Axiom Pro uh, display. So it's got Real Vision 3D, uh, plus it's got a 1KW uh, high power chirp uh, system in it. Um, the RBX 1000 software is actually very closely related to Axiom. So anytime, anytime an Axiom update comes out, RBX 1000 gets an update as well. Um, so if you run that uh, software checker, kind of like I showed you at the beginning uh, from your home screen, go to settings, and then the, you'll have that button right there for update software. If you're connected to Wi-Fi at home or in the marina, um, have it check and see uh, if you're behind on software. Um, and I would start with that. Um, if it still gives you trouble, definitely reach out to us. And from Marty, are they going to add a distance to destination of a route to the sidebar like they have a time of destination to the route? Uh, 
yes. <laughs> um, it, it, this is a, a question. Um, I've got this from a few of you over the last several months. And um, I, I swear to God, I have logged it with our software guys. Um, and I agree with you. It's kind of crazy that uh, I don't know how we don't have that in there. Um, but um, uh, in all of the different data items that you can pull up and display uh, in the sidebars or on the screen or in route calculations, um, the distance all the way to the end of a route, including all of the waypoint legs left, um, the only place you can see that currently is um, in the uh, route summary uh, page. Um, there isn't a data box for some reason that, that pulled that data in. Um, so we do have that logged as a feature request and hopefully we'll see that in uh, one of the coming uh, updates. Uh, I might be able to show you on this system where you can see that information now. If you wanna bring the Axiom back up for me, please. Um, and just close down his question. And I think to do that, uh, let's go to the chart. And I built a route earlier. Uh, it was based on simulation data that I'm running from my external simulator, but I think it'll work for our purposes here. I'm gonna go to the route library. Um, and if I view the route plan for route number one that I built, um, you can see it actually calculates uh, ETA um, and distances all along the way. Uh, and I apologize, this route is actually over in the Mediterranean. So that's why it's like 3000 miles and some change. Um, but this is where it would summarize uh, all of that information. And you can actually um, even change uh, what is displayed. You can do it based on ETA or time to go, um, which is another one um, that people like to see how much time is left on this leg, how much time is left all the way to the end. Um, but you can show it either way by going into the route options. Um, so until we get that data box uh, in there, um, this is where you can come in and find that at any time. Just go into your route library, uh, call up the route that you're following, uh, and look down to the bottom, and it'll give you uh, your distance and your ETA um, that you have left. And it looks like we might have time maybe for one more question. We're getting to the top of the hour. I'm glad there's so many questions tonight. Planning to replace my MF. C80 with Rain Marine radar hooked to it by an Axiom. Is there a way to keep the existing radar or we absolutely need to replace it with more recent like Quantum? Uh, so the C80 multifunction display that you have, um, that, that is an older unit. Um, and the radars that were used with the C80 um, are what we call an analog radar. That radar connects directly to a radar specific port on the back of a C80. And unfortunately that radar scanner is not compatible with anything we make anymore. Um, our analog radar support ended um, basically right after your generation of products. So we had the, the C series and the original E series um, of that same generation had analog radar connections. Um, and then um, everything transitioned to digital radar. So digital radars have been kind of all the thing now for, oh, probably almost 18, 19 years now. So um, unfortunately, um, you are going to have to uh, upgrade to a newer radar, or you can keep the C80 in place just to run that radar scanner. Um, it is possible to do that uh, as well. You just wouldn't be able to see the radar on your Axiom display. Um, if you do want to upgrade, uh, Quantum is a great um, alternative. You know, it's a great upgrade uh, for that. It's a very capable radar. Um, it's a very small form factor, lightweight. It's actually pretty easy to install. If you want to, you can actually run it with a wireless data link. Um, Quantum can go via Wi-Fi from the scanner to the display. You still have to get power uh, up to the display. Um, but a little installation tip that can make that easier, um, the cable that is in your boat now for your C80 display carries power uh, up the line. So um, if if you're going to abandon that radar, instead of tearing that old radar cable out, you could actually use that as the power feed uh, to the quantum. Um, so that's something you could talk to your installer, um, but they could certainly make that uh, modification to the cable. Um, and it would save them down to pull a power cable up for it and then use the wireless data link. Um, so that's uh, a popular way to do it. Um, if you need more information on that, feel free to shoot me an email and I can uh, get you some more details on it or definitely talk to your Raymarie installers. Um, I know it's something that they do all the time. Uh, with these older radar cables. And uh, I see eight o'clock, let's do one more. This will be the last one for tonight from Catherine. We are in Alaska this summer, learning our Raymarine Navionics through trial and error. I have a couple of questions for you. Can you filter the routes 
by date rather than just the number. Filter the routes by date rather than just number. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, the route manager. And I also want to look at the waypoint manager as well, because I think you, it's possible you might be talking about waypoints rather than routes. But either way, let's uh, let's take a look. We'll bring Axiom back up if you could. And uh, just close your question so we can see the whole screen. Um, so if you have uh, multiple routes in your route library, um, let's see, they by default are sorted in here alphabetically by their name. And I don't think there is a way to change that. But that's why I suspect you might actually be asking about waypoints rather than routes, because with waypoints, you can have thousands of waypoints in here. <laughs> um, and the waypoints can all have unique names or they can have numerical names. And if you don't change them by default, they are numerically named. Uh, they usually have uh, WPT for waypoint, and then they just number them sequentially in the order that they are created. So for example, um, and I apologize, I don't have a lot of waypoints in here, but you can see these are not very descriptive. Waypoint one, waypoint two, waypoint three, blah, 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 blah. Um, so these are sorted right now by date, um, but you can sort them by name. Um, you can sort them by range, so distance from the boat. Um, if you are into giving your waypoints uh, symbols other than the defaults, you can sort them by symbol uh, as well. Um, or if you add comments to your waypoints, you can also um, sort them by comments. Um, so with every waypoint, um, let me just kind of show you um, what we can do with them. Uh, I'm going to go to the waypoint details for this waypoint number eight. So let's say, for example, I wanted to change the name of it. I just simply touch on it right here, um, and I can call it whatever uh, I want to call it. Um, so maybe this is actually the anchorage. I'm just going to type in anchor just to keep it kind of brief here. And, and I spelled it incorrectly, so we're going to call it Acor, whatever that is. But you get the point. You can ca uh, call it whatever you like. Um, I can change the symbol associated with this waypoint. Um, and we have all sorts of different symbols that you can choose from, some based on fish, some based on underwater structures. We have symbols for racing. We have symbols for our first responder community. Um, and we have all these general symbols as well related to navigation. So um, some people, when they catalog their waypoints, they do have strategies for how they name them or how they assign symbols to them um, because it is something that you can sort on. So maybe I'm going to give this one a green square. Another thing we can do with waypoints that can be very helpful is we can assign them to groups. Uh, so I could create a group, for example, um, by city. So maybe I go uh, boating in Boston and I go boating in Gloucester and sometimes I go to Cape Cod. So I could have a group called Boston and a group called Gloucester and a group called Cape Cod. And I could have all the waypoints for those relative areas assigned to those groups. So that makes it again, a little bit easier to sort them in that list. Um, and then the other thing we can do is we can add comments to them. So um, this field is kind of a free form. You get 150 characters to say whatever you would like about that waypoint. Um, so maybe um, the one, as an example, I said it's an anchorage. Um, you know, maybe I want to say that's a rocky bottom here. Make sure you use extra chain, you know, whatever type of notes you want to put in. Um, you get 150 characters that you can put in here. And that becomes something that is sortable uh, in the list. Um, so this actually brings up another um, kind of cool little tip. Um, you may wonder, uh, 150 characters, do I really want to peck those in one little poke at a time um, with my MFD touchscreen? Um, you know, it's easy to type, but it's not necessarily the fastest way to type. Um, if you are into uh, managing large quantities of waypoints and routes, if you want to get descriptions on them, if you want descriptive names, um, something you can do with all of our Axiom products is you can connect a mouse and you can connect a Bluetooth keyboard uh, to the system. Um, Axioms all have a standard uh, Bluetooth radio uh, in them. Uh, you can get pretty much any Bluetooth mouse or keyboard combo. Um, and uh, because this is a, an Android based product in the background, uh, the drivers are all built in. Um, so if you wanted to do a uh, Bluetooth uh, connection to your Axiom, um, you go out to your home screen, and if you can bring this back up one more time, Mr. Producer, let me show you where the Bluetooth settings are. So I'm here on the home screen of Axiom. 
Uh, up here behind the clock and our status icons, just give them a tap and you'll see here Bluetooth settings. Um, and right now, uh, Bluetooth is turned off on my system. So if I were to turn it on, uh, just like your, your iPad or your Android tablet does, uh, Bluetooth radio comes on, it scans for nearby Bluetooth devices. So you can see it's picking up smartphones, headphones, all sorts of other stuff that's in the building here with me. Um, if you had a mouse or a keyboard that was a Bluetooth device, you would just select it. It'll probably ask you to click a key on the keyboard or click something on the mouse to confirm the connection. And then um, voila, you have um, a mouse and keyboard. Uh, and that's how I've been actually working this Axiom tonight. I have been doing it with a mouse. Uh, though rather than a Bluetooth mouse, I'm actually doing it with a USB wireless mouse. This Axiom XL has a USB port on the back. So I have plugged in a, um, a receiver, but I could do it with Bluetooth just as easily. Um, it, again, as far as the hardware goes to do that, um, the Bluetooth from the Axiom side of it is already built in. Um, and then you can uh, you know, go to your local office supply store, uh, go on Amazon, uh, pick your favorite Bluetooth mouse or keyboard um, and uh, connect it right up. Um, if you dig into the Raymarine Lighthouse Advanced Operating Manual, we actually make a suggestion for a uh, ruggedized Bluetooth keyboard. Um, this one is called uh, an iKey uh, BT80. Um, this is, uh, it's backlit, it's waterproof, it's pretty much bombproof uh, as well. Um, we chose this keyboard um, because, um, as many of you know, we supply all the electronics to the U.S. Coast Guard fleet, um, and they wanted to have keyboard capability. Um, so this is the keyboard that we officially uh, test for um, and, um, and offer um, for them to use uh, with their Raymarine systems. Uh, but this is available out there on the common market as well. If you're into this sort of thing, it has a built-in trackpad, uh, Bluetooth rechargeable, um, but the reality is that any Bluetooth keyboard and mouse combo will work. Um, these um, are really nice. They're a little bit pricey, but they do some cool things, uh, but even a cheap one works uh, just as well. And sometimes out in the salty environment, cheaper is better. And they just replace them as you need them, but that's up to you. All right, so we even did a little bit of overtime tonight. And again, um, we'll be back with the full story on the new Raymarine app uh, and Yachtsen's link when my hardware arrives. I would imagine the UPS man is gonna be here first thing in the morning. Uh, so we'll try to get that on the docket for our next Raymarine Live. Uh, again, um, Labor Day weekend, go out there, have fun, catch some fish, enjoy your time on the water, uh, have a good time with your family and friends, but please boat safely so that you can come back for our next episode of Raymarine Live. Again, if you have questions, um, drop them in the comments. For those of you that are watching this after the fact, you're watching the recording, um, drop your comments in as well, uh, because I keep an eye on these and I try to go in and I keep answering the comments continuously, even on the older episodes. Um, and if you haven't seen any of our older episodes, definitely check them out as well. Uh, hopefully there's some good content in there um, and be sure to recommend us to your friends as well. So until next time, have a great Labor Day weekend and thanks for watching. Good night.